Well, greetings and salutations, SIE test takers. This is uh, Dean Tenney coming to you from my studio in fabulous Las Vegas with episode four of our SIE exam podcast on options. We don't plan on doing a full, uh, you know, lecture on options. I will link or put in the video descriptions links to a class review of basic options and a class replay of uh, stock plus options. And that would be a better uh, format to uh, actually dig a little deeper. To uh, Tonight, what we want to do is share with you some of the aim and shoot point and click kind of questions you could expect on your SIE exam. Most of the questions as it relates to options on your SIE exam are recognition. Maybe one practical application, uh, zero judgment questions. Those are the three styles of questions. And so I'd like to share uh, those with you and uh, hopefully that'll be helpful. Now, if you're going on to a series seven, then it's gonna be a much different deal. There's gonna be you know 20 plus questions with some judgment questions. All right, so let's get started and uh, see if we can stuff as much testable content into 30 minutes or so as possible. So, you know, if you're going to open an options account, test question, I'm going to give you the options disclosure document. This document is published by the OCC. It's called the OCC disclosure document. It's called the characteristics and risks of options. It's over a hundred plus pages on all the bad things that can happen to you. It's not called risk and reward of options. It's called risk of options. I highly recommend that you read it in preparation uh, for your exam. And it tells you lots of uh, testable content in that, as well as making disclosures to the customer. For example, test question, the Options Clearing Corporation is the issuer and guarantor of all options. So for example, you say, hey, Dean, if I have an Apple 170 call and I exercise, how do I know they're going to deliver 100 shares to me when I call it away from them? I said, well, how do they know you're going to pay $17,000? You know, every con contract has two parties, but between the two parties sits the OCC. They are the issuer and guarantor of all options. Now, in equity options, the holder can exercise any time. That's called American style. You should know that American style is typical of equity options, and it means the holder can exercise any time. Whereas European style is typical of non-equity options, and you could only exercise at expiration. Now, if you choose to exercise, you're holding a call, you're holding a put, and you decide to call it away or put it to someone, you, you exercise your choice to buy or your choice to sell, uh, to ask question, the OCC assigns exercise notices randomly. So, you know, there's more than one firm that has more than one customer who's particularly short that particular series and you know uh you exercise so the occ calls uh, merrill lynch merrill lynch says why yes the occ says we assign exercise notices randomly you know by the way at expiration very testable uh expiration is 11 59 p.m on the uh, third friday of the expiry month and if at expiration, the contract has intrinsic value, that contract will be exercised. As you can exercise anytime, but at the end, if there's intrinsic value, it will be exercised. Because in your option agreement, we'll talk about that at length here in a little bit, we tell you that we haven't heard from you, uh, that we assume you'd like us to exercise. Now, within the uh, client base of the firm, the broker-dealer can do this random, five for another fair method. They can't be discriminatory. They can't say, oh, there's that jerk of a customer. Let's uh, stick it to him. No, you can't say, oh, that's my good customer. Man, I don't want to do it to him. The firm can do random five for another fair method. Most firms do it randomly because it requires less paperwork. But again, whatever you're doing, you have to tell your cust customers. You have to tell the OCC. And if you go to change, you got to tell everybody as well. Again, we're talking about some of the disclosures made in the OCC disclosure document. And we said another thing they disclosed to you in the disclosure document is the differences between equity option contracts and index option contracts. Now they're different in terms of how they work. For example, 
do you have to deliver underlying the underlying security or do you deliver the cash? You know, if I'm short in equity option, a call contract, for example, and I get exercised, I have to deliver the underlying stock, right? So if I'm short in Apple 170 calls, somebody calls away from me, I have to deliver the stock. Now, if I were short an index option, uh, well, let's say the S&P 500, and I got exercised and I had to deliver the underlying stocks in the index, my God, 100 shares of 500 stocks, nobody would play with you. So index options settle in cash. I don't actually have to deliver the index, whereas equity options, I do have to deliver the underlying stock. Now, how do we test you on that? They like to give you an answer set where they say, you know, which of the following best describes settlement of equity option contracts and resulting stock trades. And that would be choice A here, as I have in the uh, the banner. It would be T plus one for the option contract, but two T plus two for delivering the underlying, you know, delivering the stock or cash, depending on which side of the contract you're on. Now, not true of index options. Index options, like equity option contracts, when you buy them, settle T plus one. And when you exercise, that too is T plus one. And what you owe if you're short is the cash that represents whatever that intrinsic value is. I said, it's very testable to know that option contracts, again, this is in the OCC disclosure document, uh, expire on the third Friday of the expiry month at 1159. I kind of joke on a question like that. If you miss it, man, angels weep for you because, you know, we just know it's there and, you know, you've been told it's there. And so you should be able to, you know, kind of, you know, find that. So, all right. So uh, I've given you the OCC disclosure document. As I've said, there's no way you can possibly read this while I wait. So I'm going to go back to my registered option principal and I'm going to see if he'll approve you for options. So your account is going to be approved by a registered option principal. He's going to say, Dean, did you give him the OCC disclosure document? I say, yes. You know, he says, okay, I'm going to approve their account. So I'm going to call you back and say you were approved. I say, hey, good news. Uh, you were approved. Very testable. You know, this is in chronological order. So I give you the disclosure document. I get your account approved. Right. And I say, okay, within 15 days of the account approval, approval, I need back from you the option agreement that you said you've read that document and you understood it. Now, if you're late getting that back, I'm only going to allow you to do closing transactions. So disclosure, account approval, first trade. And then I tell you from account approval, I need that 15 days. So disclosure, the OCC disclosure document, account approval, we can do the first trade. And I tell you that you're late getting back that option agreement within 15 days of account approval. I'm only going to let you do closing transactions. I say, okay, so your account is approved. What do you want to do? Do you want to do an opening purchase or an opening sale? Do you want to go long or you don't want to go short? No, we have two types of option contracts. Contracts always have two parties. And you can either buy them or sell them. And so that means we have four basic option positions, right? If you can buy them or sell them, and we have calls and put contracts, that means there's four basic option contracts. And if you're doing an opening purchase, that's how you establish or add to a long position. Again, types of orders are very testable. You're going to have an answer set that says A, opening purchase, B, opening sale. C, closing sale, D, closing purchase. And depending on what they're asking you will depend on the appropriate response. If I ask you on your SIE exam, which of the following orders would be used to establish or add to a long position, you would say an opening purchase. If I ask you which of the following would be used to establish or add to a short position, you would say an opening sale. Now, let's say you did an opening purchase. You either went long a put or long a call. You know, there are three things that can happen to that option contract. So, you know, I buy an Apple December 170 call. One thing I can do is trade the contract. A good way to remember this is a memory aid device, T. The contract can be traded. The contract can be exercised or the contract can expire. 
right? So if I want to trade it, I can do a closing sale. I say, hey, how much would you be willing to pay for a contract that gives you a choice to buy 100 shares of Apple at any time between now and December at 170? That's the strike price. And you say, what'd you pay for it? I said, well, none of your damn business. That's not what we're here to discuss. You know, what I'm hoping is that, uh, you know, I can sell the contract if I'm going to trade it. I can do my closing sale for more than my opening purchase. I mean, that may or may not be the case, but that's what I'm hoping. You know, if I did an opening sale, I'm short. And I want to extinguish that obligation. I would do what's called a closing purchase. I'd buy back the contract. You know, I want to extinguish the obligation, you know. On my tutoring sites, I always joke with people, when you go to the booking page, you're doing an opening purchase. You're buying an hour of tutoring, right? That's from your perspective, you're long an hour of tutoring. And from my perspective, it's an opening sale. I have an obligation to deliver that hour to you. Yeah, you know, maybe I call you and say, listen, I'm sorry, but uh, stuff has come up. Uh, I need to uh, extinguish that obligation I have to you. Can I buy back that hour? You know, maybe I say, I'll give you 400 to give it back to me. <laughs> uh, in that case, I would be losing money. So the contract would be the same way. I'm hoping to sell it high and buy it low. Now, remember, if I'm long, I can exercise anytime I want. And we said we would only exercise if it made economic sense. If it's an equity option, you can do it anytime. If it's a European style option, only at expiration. Now, at expiration, if the contract has no intrinsic value, that contract will expire. Is that good news or bad news? Well, that depends on whether you were long or short. Now, as I mentioned, we have uh, here types of option contracts, calls and puts. And I think the most important answer set on the SIE beyond the recognition questions I'm sharing with you is this answer set. A, long call. B, short call. C, long put. D, short put. All right, we have two types of contracts, calls and puts. And you can buy them or sell them. So those are our four basic option positions. And so but also besides the recognition questions I want you to be uh, getting, I would also like you to be able to know what these contract specifications are. So if you go long a call, a lot of words for long, I could say you're the buyer, you're the owner, you're the holder. And when you're long, what you have is a choice. Choices cost money. That's what options are, choices. Now, some people like to use the word R-I-G-H-T instead of choice. It doesn't matter because you're the one who has to bring that to the party, so to speak. They're not going to say your client has a right or choice. You're the one who has to know that. So long call is a choice to buy or call the stock away at the strike price. I was using Apple. So if I'm long one Apple, December 170 call, I have the right to call away or buy Apple at 170. And the reason I have that right or choice is because I paid the premium. Short call. A short call is an obligation to sell the stock at the strike price. You know, I'm not going to oblige myself to do anything unless you give me some money. So, you know, I say, hey, listen, you give me X number of dollars and I'll stand willing to deliver 100 shares of Apple to you at any time between now and December at 170. That would be a short call. As we said, each contract has two parties. You know, somebody who's paid the premium, somebody who has received the premium. All right, we have a long put. So we have a putters. You know, if I'm long a put, buyer, owner, holder, I have a choice to sell the stock at the strike price. So if I'm long an Apple December 170 put, I'm buying that opening purchase, but now I have a choice to sell. You know, an analogy that I think sometimes is helpful when you're struggling with, uh, you know, contract uh, specifications, it was what we're going over here now, is an analogy. Right, so if I'm short the put, I'm the put e, not the put er. I have an obligation to buy the stock at the strike price. You know, this uh, car didn't exist. Here comes the analogy: contracts exist outside the securities industry. And this car was uh, not available yet. I was uh, it was available on a win issue basis, perhaps. And uh, but I wanted one, and I went to the car dealer and I said, "Hey, Mr. Car Dealer." How about I give you $3,000? I'd like to pay you a premium. I'd like to have a choice to call away or buy the first one of those cars off the boat from Japan for $25,000. He said, well, Dean, the manufacturer suggested retail price is 24. And I said, well, obviously, I'm not going to call it away at 25 if I can buy it at 24. 
you know, if it gets here and it's 24, I'm not going to exercise. You just get to keep the $3,000. Do I want something in written form? I do. I car dealer agree to sell said vehicle for $25,000. I'm long the call. He's short the call. He says, uh, Dean, several weeks later, he called me. He said, Dean, the car is here. I said, well, I'm on my way. He said, I want to talk to you. I said, fine. I get there. It's beautiful. He said, Dean, I just had an offer for $32,000. And what I'd like to do is buy back your contract. I'd like to get that contract back from you and rip it up. And I'd be willing to give you $5,000 to give me back that contract so I'm no longer obliged. And I said, well, gee, you must think I'm new. You know, why in the world would I sell that contract for five when you just told me it's worth seven? My choice to buy the car at 25 with the car at 32 is worth seven. If I was like to walk, I'd want at least seven. I'd at least want the intrinsic value, probably some time value as well. I said, unfortunately for you, Mr. Car Dealer, I'm going to exercise. So I paid $25 for the car, $3,000 for the contract. So I'm out $28. Call up, strike price plus premium. That's my break even. Right? Boom. Long the put. You know, I was getting ready to lease a high end automobile. And the dealer told me that at the end of the lease, the car is going to be worth $60,000. I go, really? I said, you know, you and I have opposite expectations about the value of this car at the end of the lease. I'd like to give you $4,000. What's the catch? We won't give you money unless there's kind of some kind of catch. I said, well, listen, you and I have opposite expectations about the price of this car at the end of the lease. And whenever two parties like us have opposite expectations, option contracts have two parties with opposite expectations, uh, we can make a bet. For this $4,000, I'd like to have the choice to put or sell the car to you at the end of the lease for $60,000. You know, he said, well, what if you can sell in the auto trader at 65 or 70? I said, well, if I can do that. I'm obviously going to exercise the contract. I'm not going to stick it to you at 60 unless the market price is down from that. So let's say that, uh, you know, at the end of the lease, the car's uh, worth uh, 40 grand. Am I going to make him perform on the contract? Absolutely. I'm going to say, where's my $60,000? He said, you're making me pay 60 when it's only worth 40? I go, yes, absolutely. He said, I'm going to lose 20 grand. I go, no, no, you get to keep the four. You're just going to lose 16. He goes, man, you're so good at my loss. I said, well, your loss is my gain. If we're going to have putters, we got to have put ease, right? So those are two types of contracts. Now on the SIE, on your Series 7, the underlying interest isn't going to be an automobile. It's going to be a stock. It's going to be a choice to buy the stock at 25 or a choice to sell the stock at 60, whatever the case may be. Now, one of the things we have to be able to do as it relates to options is distinguish Somebody who's coming to the options market to hedge to offset risk versus somebody who's coming to the options market to actively pursue risk. So those are our two basic players, people who are hedging, people who are speculating. I don't know if I ever get to teach a series three class again, but it was always a fun class to watch people pull up because half the class would show up in pickup trucks and cowboy hats and boots and just got through milk and some stuff. I mean, these are guys who have soybeans and they're coming to the futures market to lay off the risk. If they're going to lay off the risk, somebody's got to have, uh, say, bring it on, right? So it's going to be an entirely different thing to come to the options market to head to stock position. Now, the two stock positions you can have are a long stock position or a short stock position. You know, if I'm long the stock and I'm trying to protect that stock position, I would sleep a lot better if I had some insurance. So one thing I could do is buy a put to protect my stock position. You know, the foundation of Mark Cuban's fortune is selling broadcast.com to Yahoo for over a billion dollars in stock. And, you know, at the time, Yahoo was over $100 a share. And Cuban said, you know, I want to hedge this position. I don't want to go backwards. And so he bought protective puts, not puts where he's speculating, puts he's using to protect a stock position. And they had a strike price of 95. And when those contracts expired, the stock was $20. So is Mark going to sell it at 20 or is he going to stick it to people at 95? He's going to exercise his puts. If you don't want to buy the stock at 95, you shouldn't have uh, been short the puts, right? <laughs>
Anyways, then that year he paid two hundred million dollars in capital gains. I said, "Woof, you know that's impressive. That's impressive." Now another thing I might want to do if I have a stock position, not so much to hedge, but to generate additional income. You know, I might want to sell a call. I say, "Listen, somebody be willing to pay you hundreds of dollars in advance to agree to sell high stock we just bought low." You know, for example, today we could buy Apple at one seventy one. And we could sell a 175 call for four. Somebody's going to pay us $400 to agree to sell at 175 stock we bought at 171. And that's a covered call, covered because we're actually agreeing to sell stock we own. And we do that to generate additional income. So if we have long stock, we're either going to go long a put for protection or we're going to go short a call to generate additional income. And again, I'll link to video descriptions that lay out and do tease and show you all kinds of matrices and all kinds of good stuff. Uh, this is just our podcast. You may be listening in the car. It's available on YouTube. It's available on Spotify. So I'm trying to keep it more audio oriented uh, than some of our lectures. Okay, so the other stock position I have is a short stock position. You know, that's why I sell borrowed stock. You know, in most industries, when you sell things you don't own, it's called fraud. But not in our industry. I can sell borrowed stock. So I call my broker and I say, listen, I want to borrow 100 shares of uh, Zoom. And then I sell it short. So I'm going to get six grand from selling the borrowed stock. And again, hedging is about what if I'm wrong? And I say, you know what I should do is put in a ceiling here. I should establish the choice to buy back the borrowed stock at a set price at any time between now and some future date. Because if I did that, I would no longer have unlimited risk. That's a pretty good, cool thing. If I uh, buy a protective put on a short stock position, I've changed that position from unlimited risk to limited risk. How cool is that? Now, I would tell you when it comes to hedging, you're never going to short a put in that answer set. So as I told you, this is the answer set, the most important answer set on the test. Long call, short call, long put, short put. And if we have a stock position, we're either going to go short a call or long a put, depending on what protection means, buy the option. And if we're short the stock, we're going to go long the call. We never do the short put because uh, you're going to have unlimited risk and nobody wants that. Now, speculation is our four basic option positions we've already discussed. And it's pretty simple. If you want to buy an option contract, a lottery ticket, you just pay your premium. Worst case, you're going to lose it. Right. So if you buy an Apple 170 call, you're just speculating that Apple is going up and going up at least enough to cover your out-of-pocket cost. Call up strike price plus premium. And if you sell a naked call, oh my goodness, that's just not smart. So we have to be able on the SIE to distinguish a covered call, somebody who's agreeing to sell stock they own, with somebody who's agreeing to sell stock they don't own. Wow. You know, agreeing to sell stock, short call, and you don't own the stock. That's called a naked or uncovered call. And that subjects you, test question, to unlimited risk. Uncovered or naked. I think about, you know, if you're outside the privacy of your own home and you're naked, somebody might say, gee, why don't you cover yourself? Right? So uh, we've been looking and uh, talking about the strike price uh, of Apple at 170 with Apple at 171. And again, I don't think it's a big deal on the SIE, but there is a relationship between the strike price and the market price. You know, I think a great memory aid device is call up and put down. Call up helps us to kind of do some things. Uh, call up helps us determine and put down intrinsic value and on the speculative basic positions, break evens. So uh, Apple today is 171. And we've been discussing a 170 call. So the market price is up. And so that 170 call has one point of what we call intrinsic value. Intrinsic value and the money are synonymous terms. Now, intuitively, you already know intrinsic value. You intuitively knew that if I had a choice to buy at 25 and it was worth 32, that that had intrinsic value. That was my car analogy. And intuitively, you knew if I had a choice to sell at 60 and it was 40, that it had 20 points of intrinsic value. It's the relationship of the strike price to the market price. And the premium you're paying or collecting has two components. 
the intrinsic value and the time value. As a test taker, again, I don't think you need to get too in the weeds on the SIE, but you know, options are a wasting asset, time value erodes. So time value is gonna go poof. At expiration, the contract is only gonna be worth its intrinsic value. And again, that's the relationship of the market price to the strike price. Call up, market price is up from the strike price, the contract is in the money, it has intrinsic value. You can't tell me whether that's good news or bad news unless I tell you, you know, you're long, you're short, you know, I'm just asking about that relationship. There's no such thing as negative intrinsic value. You know, it either has it or it doesn't. If it's an Apple 170 call and Apple's at uh, 168, then that contract is out of the money, right? You know, uh, the strike price doesn't change, but the market price does. You know, 170 put right now with Apple at 171 is out of the money. But, you know, if Apple goes to 168, we said the call is out of the money, but now the put is in the money by two points. Again, we're trying to keep this about 30 minutes uh, as these podcast episodes. And I will link. I hope you found some uh, good test content in here. Uh, I have reviewed with you some of the recognition style questions you could expect. And, uh, and I'll link to those video descriptions. We are recording this live, and so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to check and see what is in our chat that is uh, germane to what we're discussing, and if not, I'll still answer it, but then I'll, uh, you know, you cut it off at that point. All right, so remember, inch by inch, your SIE is a cinch. Yard by yard, your SIE is hard.